Apple is known for creating revolutionary devices that redefine their product categories and disrupt various markets. Take the iPhone for example. It forced us to reimagine what a smartphone was and how it could be used. But it also made devices like music players obsolete, which began the decline of the iPod. And in this video, we're going to explore a very similar situation as it pertains to the netbook. This is Greg with Apple Explained, and if you want to help decide which video topics I cover, make sure you're subscribed, and these voting polls will show up right in your mobile activity feed. Now, before we discuss how Apple destroyed the netbook industry, we need to begin by defining what a netbook even is, and that includes understanding the state of the tech market back when netbooks were first introduced. In 2007, Apple introduced the iPhone, which was arguably the first modern smartphone consumers had ever seen, and it helped establish the beginnings of the mobile tech revolution. You see, up until that point, mobile devices weren't very capable machines. Sure, you could answer emails and do some rudimentary internet browsing with something like the Blackberry, but there were serious limitations that prevented it from delivering a desktop class experience iPods were also very popular, but they were designed for very specific purposes, like listening to music or watching TV shows and movies you bought from iTunes. And keep in mind, modern tablets like the iPad hadn't been invented yet. So if you wanted a traditional desktop experience on the go, your only option was to lug around a notebook computer, which weren't as thin and light in 2007 as they are today. Many computer manufacturers identified this gap in the market and decided to bring back a product concept that had been attempted in the past but failed virtually every time. And that product was the netbook. Netbooks were basically miniaturized notebook computers that included only the most essential features in an attempt to be as affordable, compact, and light as possible. Now, as I mentioned, the history of this product goes back before 2007 but had never seen much commercial success, and I'll tell you why. In the 90s, netbooks were actually quite expensive. One of the most popular, Toshiba's Libretto, debuted with a retail price of $2,000, which wasn't much cheaper than a standard notebook, which featured more power and a more capable operating system. That was another issue. Most netbooks required proprietary software applications in order to run properly on their less powerful processors. And for those that didn't, its software was typically stripped down and suffered from usability limitations. So with all those disadvantages, the netbook market never experienced much growth during that period. But all this changed in 2007 thanks to a few different factors. First, computer processing technology had advanced enough to fit a sufficient amount of power into a small form factor. So for many users, netbooks were powerful enough for their daily tasks. Second, the rise of web-based applications and mobile networking made software more suitable for netbooks and eliminated the need for proprietary application development. Third, the cost of netbooks were lower than ever before at about $300 to $400, heavily undercutting the average notebook computer price of about $700. And when you combine the affordability factor with a 2008 global recession that affected consumer spending, it's easy to see why netbooks became an appealing option for users who wanted a near desktop computer experience on the go. In fact, netbooks proved to be so successful that the market grew 30 times from 2007 to 2008, totaling about 12 million units sold. And by 2010, netbooks accounted for nearly 20% of the entire portable computer market, which was a pretty impressive showing from a product category that had failed to gain traction in the past. But there was one serious compromise that netbooks had to make in order to achieve their compact form factor and affordable price, and that was an enjoyable user experience. Netbooks had small, low-resolution displays with low brightness that made them virtually unusable outdoors or in bright environments. They had cramped keyboards that made typing quite frustrating, their trackpads were tiny and required multiple swipes to move a cursor across the screen, their battery life was typically too short to be reliable throughout the day, and their slow processor and small hard drive made them virtually unusable for any serious productivity work. And while consumers appeared to be okay with all those compromises, it left too much room for the industry to be disrupted by a more user-friendly product. And that's exactly what happened in April 2010 with the release of Apple's iPad. In fact, during its keynote introduction in January, Steve Jobs mentioned the netbook. If there's going to be a third category of device, it's going to have to be better at these kinds of tasks than a laptop or a smartphone. Otherwise, it has no reason for being. Now, some people have thought 
But that's a netbook. The problem is, netbooks aren't better at anything. <laughs> they, they're slow, they have low quality displays, and they run clunky old PC software. So they're not better than a laptop at anything, they're just cheaper. They're just cheap laptops. And what Steve Jobs said was true. Netbooks hadn't been better at doing any task. They were simply a cheap version of traditional notebooks. And the iPad was the exact opposite. It included modern technology like its 9.7 inch multi-touch display and an optimized operating system that featured an app store which made the device even more capable and valuable. All this at a starting price of just $500, which put it in the netbook's price range. So what the iPad did is it took the features users loved about netbooks, like their compact size and affordability, and included them in a device with none of the netbook's compromises. The iPad had a beautiful, bright, high-resolution touch display that eliminated the need for a physical keyboard and trackpad. And it had 10-hour battery life, which was at least double what you'd get from any netbook at the time. It also had a thin, compact design that was built for portability. And this isn't even considering its high-quality industrial design made from aluminum and glass as opposed to clunky plastic netbooks. It was clear Apple had a winning product that was poised to single-handedly destroy the netbook industry. So it may come as a surprise to learn that the iPad was one of the most criticized products Apple ever released. And I'm not talking about the usual hate from random people on the internet, I'm talking about reputable news outlets that were quick to dismiss the iPad for reasons that seemed pretty obscure. PC World published an article that said this, At the end of the day, the show's centerpiece, the iPad, is just a big iPod touch. Lots of folks will want it, in a hypothetical sort of way, but it's hard to imagine all that many of them will fork over the initial $500 for a crippled version. Here's another article from Fortune. It said, when I put it down on my sofa and caught it in a less flattering light, I saw my unattractive fingerprints all over it. When I took it to work the next day, it weighed down the new handbag I'd bought in part because it would fit it. And here's a breakdown of the criticism from Twitter users. 27% felt the iPad was just a big iPod Touch or iPhone, 23% felt its name sounded too silly, 15% made feminine hygiene jokes, 13% were upset it didn't support Flash, 12% were upset it didn't include a camera, 5% wanted multitasking capabilities, and the remaining 5% were concerned about AT&T network issues on the 3G models. Now, looking back, these complaints may seem pretty strange because we all know the iPad has become something much different than the iPod Touch or iPhone, and we've all gotten used to its name. But in 2010, criticism of the iPad from people online was overwhelmingly negative. I remember a friend on Facebook making a post that said something like, why would someone need an iPad when a laptop already does everything? It's just another pointless luxury product Apple can sell to their fans who just want a status symbol. Similar sentiments were echoed across so many different forums and social media sites that Steve Jobs actually became annoyed and depressed by the public's reaction to the iPad. Especially since he was quoted as saying the iPad was the most important product of his life. So for him, that level of backlash was likely unexpected. And that criticism continued until the iPad was actually released to the public about two months later. And I have to give David Pogue of the New York Times credit, because what he predicted turned out to be true. He said, That criticism will last until the iPad actually goes on sale in April. Then, if history is any guide, Phase 3 will begin. Positive reviews, people lining up to buy the thing, and the mysterious disappearance of the basher bloggers. And that's exactly what happened. The iPad went on to become one of Apple's fastest selling products, and the company actually had trouble keeping up with demand for weeks after its release. And what does all of this have to do with the netbook? Well, it effectively destroyed the netbook market overnight, with sales declining once the iPad was introduced, and just one year later in 2011, tablet sales overtook netbooks for the first time. By 2012, Dell, Toshiba, Asus, Acer, and MSI all stopped manufacturing their netbooks and instead began focusing on more powerful ultrabooks to compete with the MacBook Air. So just like that, the netbook industry came to a screeching halt, and all because of Apple's iPad. But that was about seven years ago, and today many people are asking, could netbooks ever have a place in the computer market again? And I think as long as great tablets like the iPad are around, the answer to that is no. 
But on the other hand, we are seeing products like the Chromebook becoming more popular year after year. And Chromebooks appear to be serving the same market as netbooks once did. They're affordable and built to be used with online web apps provided by Google. This means you don't need a large hard drive since all your data is in the cloud. They've proven to be very popular in the education market, with schools all across the US adopting Chromebooks in the classroom. And they're actually eating into Microsoft's domination of the computer market since Chromebooks run Linux instead of Windows. But the biggest issue with the Chromebook is that it's still a notebook computer, and the computer market as a whole has been in decline since 2012. That's why Apple has been saying we're entering the post-PC era. Technology today is centered around mobile devices like smartphones, tablets, and smartwatches. And we're likely to see that trend continue for quite some time until traditional computers are only used by specific people for a specific purpose. Now, as you can imagine, I usually have to stay up late at night to finish YouTube videos, but I don't enjoy the taste of energy drinks or coffee. So instead, I eat caffeinated chocolate. And my favorite brand, Awake, was kind enough to sponsor this video. They offer delicious bite-sized chocolates that contain 50 milligrams of caffeine, the equivalent of half a cup of coffee. And you can choose from four flavors, milk and dark chocolate, caramel, and peanut butter. They're gluten-free, don't have any artificial colors or flavors, and are much more convenient than brewing a cup of coffee. Now, if you want to try these for yourself, just click the link in the description. And don't forget to use the discount code Apple Explained for 25% off your order. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.